Hey guys, um, I have a new stand-up desk. It's a, it's a fancy way to stay healthy, I guess. Um, so, yeah, first time I've shot a video this way. Let's see how it turns out. I'll try not to move around and freak you out too much. All right, so, um, bit of a problem in class this morning. Specifically, I, my fault completely, forgot to give the web option people enough warning that I was intending to have a Friday class. Of course, we don't usually have Friday classes, so nobody from the web option showed up to tape it. Um, I still gave my class, but obviously it's not taped, so now I'm giving it again just for you guys. Um, all right, so let me jump in. Just continuing where we left off, uh, which was sp talking about anxiety disorders, and we'd already kind of gone through this slide, but I want to highlight something about this slide. There's a few themes I'm going to keep kind of hitting on as we go through um, this, this section on mental illness, and one of the themes I want to hit on is how sometimes a small biological factor can give rise to behavior that looks, well, for lack of a better word, crazy. You know, where, where we start to think, what the heck is wrong with that person? Um, when often the answer to that is, well, there's some very simple basic thing, some basic way the brain's not working right, and that's giving rise to all this. So in the case of panic attacks, which is what we were talking about, I just want to re-emphasize that, you know, we have this part of our brain here called the amygdala, and its purpose is to sense danger. But what's dangerous, right? And and there's all, there's always random activity in the brain anyway. And we've all, by in fact, had this feeling where we might have suddenly felt a little nervous or a little anxious and not known why. That's probably very normal. But in the case of some people, the amygdala is a little overactive, and so it can it can give that person a sense of extreme danger. Um, in a case where there is no danger, and as I described last class, you know, that can give rise to them bolting out of the subway, not talking to anybody, pushing their way by everybody, running out into the street, and anybody who looked at that be behavior would say, now, what is wrong with that person? What the heck are they doing? There's not even anything to run away from. So they might look crazy, right? But in reality, it's just that slightly overactive amygdala. So, you know, a good example of how we can look at behavior every now and then and make this quick judgment um, that can have really powerful implications, you know, to suggest that somebody's not normal or not right. Um, but in reality, it may be no different in some level than, than many other illnesses that happen. It just manifests in this way that makes us fearful, probably, which is why we react the way we do. Okay, so I just wanted to reemphasize that, and I'll do that every now and then. But now let's move on. Bye-bye panic attacks. Um, still staying with anxiety disorders, so to hold that thread, remember we began talking about people who had sort of health anxiety issues. Um, now we moved on to panic attack. Now the sort of milder form of panic attacks, if you will, a very common thing, which is to have phobias. But there's phobias and then there's phobic disorders. So they're related, it's just a question of extremity and how drastically your phobia affects your life. In a general sense, um, having a phobia refers to having um, an irrational fear and a persistent one. You know, not just now I'm scared of something weirdly, but I'm always scared of, well, I had one student I talked to today who's scared of butterflies. Butterflies scare the crap out of her. Um, she wasn't always scared of butterflies, but she became scared of butterflies at some point, and now she is. So I think you and I would agree that of all the critters in the world, butterflies are not really very dangerous. They don't warrant fear. They don't deserve the fear. Um, but for that per particular individual, they were scared of butterflies. All right. Well, so what? Right? You can avoid butterflies, generally speaking, which is, again, another kind of theme I want to highlight, that just because you may have an irrational fear doesn't mean you have some real problem. Uh, it's only a problem if it interferes with your life. So for example, if you had claustrophobia, the fear of confined spaces, well, you know, let's say you got a fantastic job offer, but that fantastic job offer uh, requires you to go down into a mine, a coal mine or something like that. And you might want to take the job. Like, I really love everything about the job, but my phobia is preventing me from doing something I really want to do. Now you might seek treatment. And as you'll see, there are treatments uh, for this kind of thing. 
But if it's not really majorly interfering with your life, it's not really what we call a phobic disorder. It's just sort of a phobia. Um, here are some of the most common, supposedly the 10 most common phobias. Uh, let me just highlight here that agoraphobia, again, as I mentioned before, it's not, it, here it says the fear of open spaces. I, I like this example to show you how general these things can be referred to sometimes, but how inaccurate they sometimes are when referred to generally. Um, agoraphobics are not afraid of wide open spaces. They're afraid of the things that might happen in those spaces. So particularly a classic example would be somebody who has a lot of epileptic seizures um, every day, grand mal seizures, uh, and they feel embarrassed when it happens, especially when it happens in public. And so they might get to a point where they don't want to leave the house. They want to stay in their house because if they have the seizure, at least they're having it in their home. They're not embarrassed. They're not, you know, the subject of all this attention. Um, and so we might describe someone like that as agoraphobic. They don't want to leave their house. But it's because of the safety and security of the house and the insecurity of the outside world with respect to their seizures in that case. All right. So the fear of open space is kind of... Um, um, exaggerates that in a weird way. All right. Fine. Ha, let me see. Yeah, I did find it funny that there's no social phobia here, um, speaking in public, but also going to parties, trying to introduce yourself to new people. Most of us hate that kind of meet and greet situation. Um, so social phobia, I would think, is very common, probably number one. I'm surprised it's not on the list. With respect to causes, what makes somebody phobic? Um, some people say that some phobias are um, genetic almost. Let me see if there's the one... Well, we got arachnophobia there, but a lot of people have a phobia of snakes. I don't know what that's called. Snakeophobia. Um, something like that. Whatever the Latin word for snake is. Rep reptil... Anyway. Alright, so uh, <laughs> some people claim that the fear of snakes is ingrained. Um, that it's part of humanity, that for generations we've had to run away from snakes and so somehow we're scared of them. Um, most psychologists believe that most phobias actually develop as a, as a function of conditioning. That either we've, um, let's say we're, we're afraid of water, maybe we uh, almost drowned in a pool. Um, that could make us claustrophobic too, by the way, having that feeling like I couldn't breathe, I was stuck somewhere, you know, those symptoms of drowning are similar to the symptoms of claustrophobia. So if somebody had some traumatic um, experience like that where they felt trapped, that could develop as claustrophobia. Um, a lot of these phobias too are negatively reinforced, and here's what I mean by that. Let's pick one. Let's say this uh, arachnophobia, spider phobia. If you're scared of spiders, then if you're somewhere and there's suddenly a spider right there, what are you going to do? You're going to move away from it really quickly. As you move away from it, of course, you're putting distance between you and this potential danger. And that makes the danger less. So you had a negative thing in your world, but your behavior of retreating made that negative thing less powerful. So you've, you've result, we reduced a negative, which is reinforcing your behavior. So in the future, you're more likely to get the heck away from the spider again as well. Every time you run away from whatever it is you're scared of, you're reinforcing that irrational fear. Uh, and so the claim is sometimes these fears might start small, but as people experience the stimuli and keep uh, escaping and escaping and escaping, they're in fact reinforcing and strengthening that phobia. Uh, and so it won't be surprising when we get to treatments that a lot of the treatments will involve you not running away. Uh, but instead interacting with the, with the source of your fear, but doing so in a relaxed way. We'll get there. Let's move on. All right. Still with an anxiety disorder, and I, I, I want you to see all the ways that anxiety can kind of play out. Um, let's talk about obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, obsessive compulsive disorder is what it sounds like. These are people who have obsessive thoughts about something. So some thought is running through their head over and over and over and over again. Um, and in fact, quite often, the only way they can think to get that thought out of their head is to do something. So they feel compelled to do something. Let me be clear about that. The most common form um, of obsessive compulsive disorder is probably the desire to be free of germs. 
you know, we could go back here. There's there's something called uh, mysophobia here, fear of being contaminated. So there are some people that are very extreme about that. They worry about it all the time. So they wake up in the morning and they've been in bed and they've been like, there's germs all over the bed, there's germs all over the sheet. So the first thing they have to do is go in and wash up, clean totally, right? Including cleaning their hands. As soon as they clean, at that moment, they feel better. They don't feel contaminated. So that act of cleaning um, actually makes them feel better. It's once again, negative reinforcement. That uckiness of germs is now gone. They've removed a negative stimulus and they get reinforced for doing that. Um, of course, once you're clean, you start interacting with the world and you start touching things and doorknobs and um, smartphones and things in your kitchen, things in your bathroom, whatever. Uh, and as these people start interacting with the world, they start feeling more and more and more contaminated and they obsess about it. Oh, there's germs everywhere. And that's all they can think about are the germs they're interacting with. Um, and as they think about this more and more and more, they must go wash up, you know, maybe wash their hands. That might be enough for some people, but usually they wash their hands like from the, from the arm down, right? So they dig in there, they wash themselves all up and now they, they feel better. Whew, okay, I feel good now. But then they have to leave the washroom. You gotta touch a door often to leave the washroom. And you know, you go back to your workplace, which is a cubicle full of crappy stuff. And, and for a real obsessive compulsive, you know, as they're in there, they're starting to worry again about the germs. Germs, 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 germs are everywhere and they have to go wash up. So some of these obsessive compulsive people might have to go visit the washroom every 10 minutes um, to feel better. And if you have to do that in the workplace, that's going to be a problem uh, with your life. So that's a sense of it. Now I mentioned here, people with obsessive compulsive disorder know they have it. Um, there's no doubt. They know that they're constantly thinking about this and they're constantly doing something. These are the rituals we talk about. Um, there are a couple of other examples just to kind of flesh it out a little bit. There are people called checkers, okay? And they, the classic example would be one like the following. Let's say they ironed their clothes this morning and they, their iron, they don't trust it. They're not sure if it'll just turn off by itself. Um, so they iron their clothes, they did the rest of their stuff, they're leaving, about to leave the house, but then they think, crud, did I, did I turn the iron off? Is it still on? And if I leave that iron on, could it catch fire, catch my house on fire? And heck, maybe I have a dog in the house and I, I don't want my dog to be caught in the house fire. I'd better go check. And so they go up, stairs, check, iron's off. Okay, cool. Whew. We've all done that, right? But here's the difference. They go back downstairs, they get their coat on, they do whatever, they start to leave the door and they go, did I check right? Am I sure it's off? Because if it's not off, there's gonna be a fire and my dog's blah, 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 blah. And they start thinking about this all again and they're pretty sure that they checked, but they have this, what I say here, an obsessive doubt. They're not absolutely positive. And the only way they can be sure is to go check again. And so they go check again. Okay, cool, it's off, fine. Go about their business, starting to leave, but then they're not sure they checked well enough. And so they go check again. So they might be checking irons, they might be checking whether the stove is off, they might be checking whether doors are locked, whatever. But there are things these people check to confirm that something's true and then almost immediately start to doubt whether they checked well. And so they have to go back and go back and go back, okay? Apparently others are, have this obsessive fear of doing something prohibited. I'm going to do something bad right now. I'm worried about it, and so they fear about it. I, I don't know about that. Uh, but, they, but they do all these sorts of things, okay? Very troubling, very bothersome to them. They want to, um, they want to stop obsessing. Uh, they want to live their lives, because it really interferes. Um, but that's another example of anxiety disorder. Again, we'll come back to all of these when we talk about treatments. But right now, I'm just kind of giving you the giving you the uh, description of a lot of these. So let's move on. And these ones are kind of fun and interesting. Um, remember I talked about these different perspectives of mental disorders and, and I mentioned how different disorders kind of align sometimes with different perspectives. The ones we're gonna talk about now, so-called dissociative disorders, um, really align much more with the Freudian kind of psychodynamic view. They kind of come out of that view to some extent. And I have to tell you at the beginning, these are very controversial. There is disagreement about whether these disorders exist at all. 
people will say this happens to them. Um, but some psychologists wonder if they're lying. Okay, so I'll just say that at the beginning, but let's talk about some of them. Um, the notion is that sometimes people can find themselves in extremely stressful, extremely uncomfortable situations in life. And that what may happen to some people is a so-called disruption in consciousness, um, which causes some change in the person's identity or their memory. So let's do memory first. The dissociative amnesia case. Imagine somebody who, well the example I gave in class was somebody who, who went to war. And so they're in a wartime situation um, and they experience something horrific, absolutely horrible. Um, let's imagine that they go and everybody else in their troop um, gets wiped out by something. Some horrible thing happens, they survive, nobody else does. What sometimes happens to people who, who suffer that kind of trauma is that they literally forget everything. Maybe just around the trauma, you know, maybe just for the days and months around when that happened, or maybe everything. They forget who they are, they don't know why they are, where they are. So in some cases it's memory loss, in some cases it's a little bit of identity loss too. Um, and they literally, you know, show this, this kind of psychological amnesia. They weren't hit on the head, there's no reason to believe their brain was compromised, and yet they're acting as though it was. They're acting as though there are parts of their life they just cannot remember. And that's called dissociative amnesia, again, caused by this kind of stress. Let's just carry through some of these and we'll see the link. A more sort of extreme form um, is called dissociative fugue. Uh, any of you who are musicians may know that a fugue in a musical context is when um, a piece of music suddenly changes its style. So, so something goes in a very different direction. Maybe the tempo changes, the melody changes, everything goes a little different. Um, in a dissociative fugue, same idea applied to a person, a personality. So here's the classic example. Um, I picked on me, so I'll just keep picking on me. Let's say, you know, I come to class one day, you guys know who I am, everything's cool, but for whatever reason on that day, my life falls apart, okay? Maybe I get caught doing something horrific at the university and they fire me. And because I've been fired, my wife says, well, I don't want to live with a bum, so you're toast. And, and she starts divorce proceedings. Uh, and so, you know, I have all this stuff happening to me, all this stress, my life is falling apart. What sometimes happens is, well, Professor Jordans is gone. You know, the next day, the next class, I'm supposed to be there. I'm not there. And in fact, what you learn is nobody has seen me. I have disappeared off the face of the planet. I'm gone, never to be seen again in Toronto, but I am seen again. I'm seen again in Calgary, but is it really me? It, it looks like me, um, it maybe sounds like me, but I like different stuff, I dress differently, I hang around with different people, I have a different job, I have essentially a different life. I am essentially a different person within the same body. So the claim is that person that you knew in Toronto had a fugue state, split. I somehow left that personality behind and moved on to a new one. And most of the people who get discovered after this, they act as though and speak as though that previous version of them never existed and they don't know them. They will say, well, all I can really remember is my life in Calgary. And, you know, I don't, I don't really remember what happened before Calgary. So a little bit of that dissociative amnesia as well. But much more extreme. Because this person, you know, didn't show up at a hospital saying, I can't remember anything. They just moved. They just changed. Um, and became this other person. So fascinating. We see that happen sometimes. Again, is this a real psychological phenomenon? Or do they just pick up and go and change and then suddenly they don't want to admit to their previous life? We're not sure. It gets a step weirder as we get into dissociative identity disorder. Um, in the case of dissociative identity disorder, this is what you guys know of as multiple personality disorder, okay? which we are really going to distinguish from schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is not multiple personality disorder. But there are individuals who claim, usually as a result of trauma or stress, that they have multiple personalities that live within the same body. 
here's the prototypical story again with a real Freudian twist I've mentioned this to you before but let me build on it a little bit um, let's say we imagine a little girl who has um, you know parents including a father and the father for the m most part is a fantastic loving caring father that you know does everything they should do for their little girl except every now and then maybe they go out they drink too much and they turn into a monster and when that monster comes home um, he does things to that little girl that are anything but fatherly okay so now we have this little girl who has to deal with this right has to deal with the fact that her father is mostly a beautiful loving father and she wants to keep that father but occasionally is a monster and you know doesn't doesn't want anything to do with the monster so the psychoanalytic claim or theory is that in that situation what can happen is the following that little girl when she recognizes the monster is here could split off a part of herself and that part of herself is the part that will deal with the monster okay that part of herself will understand and recognize what's going on and will strategically do whatever needs to be done in order to survive this situation but the original part of her ends up now being insulated from that the original part of her essentially goes to sleep during these encounters and has no awareness of what happens during that time it's the split off one that has to deal with what happens the other one is left protected uh, and so when the monster leaves and it's over now this first version can continue living her life and can continue loving her father um, while the other personality within her is the one that knows the true nature of the father etc okay and so that from that period on these two people can live within the same body with the one um, being much more what we often call worldly okay much more um, understanding of the beauties and vices of life um, but the but the original personality is much more protected much more innocent much more whatever because the other person deals with the crap in life okay so this person could grow up and have multiple personalities I want to give you two examples of this um, one is the one that's linked here so I'm going to play this and this is a woman who talks about um, her own situation and her development of multiple personalities. I'm not going to play the whole thing, but I'll play a bit of it. Um, and I hope you can hear it well. I'm going to put my mic towards the computer just to make sure. when I knew I couldn't get away. And it's, it's when I knew I had to stay. And um, the, the baby that walked out into the street that tried to run away just gave up and said, it's not, I can't do it. I can't stay here. And my perception of that is that another baby came. Then another baby said, okay, I'll be Katie, and I'll take your place, and you can go to sleep. And that's when I started seeing that creating other personalities was a way to get out of whatever problems I was having. I started 
with just three, and the one that grew got to be a year and a half old, and she was called Little Katie. And then when my brother was born, I made more, I created more. There was one that was called Honey, but her name really was Clara. Then there was Jean. She was about four. Well, being a girl didn't work, so maybe being a boy would work. So we made a boy. There was a whole bunch of them that were like six, seven, and eight. All right, so I'm going to just turn this back. I'm just going to stop this part there. Um, you get a feeling, but I mean, that's just, you know, a person walking us through again a little bit of that story. You hear that sense of abuse, that sense of wanting to escape, that sense of feeling like you can't escape, and therefore the creating of a new personality that's willing to deal with the stuff you don't want to deal with. So that's a pretty prototypical kind of case. Now, I also want to show you um, a little bit of this one. Um, this is a um, classic example of, well, I mean, this really was, it was this patient, Eve, that really introduced the potential of multiple personalities to the world. And there's a movie about this in 1957. You can watch it there if you want. The Three Faces of Eve, kind of fascinating. I'm just going to give you a little snippet. And what I want to highlight are is this, well, I, I want you to see a personality change. So what you're going to see originally is the version of Eve, which we sometimes call Eve White, who is the demure, sad, scared, quiet, yeah, kind of person. But at some point, the person speaking to her will ask to speak to Eve Black. Eve Black is the more worldly part of her personality, or the w more worldly personality, I should say. Um, and when you, when you see her transform, I want you to notice that it's not just what she says or what she claims, it's how she says it. It's how she holds her body. It's how she uses her mouth. Is, is she, you know, smiling versus sad? Like, watch the whole change of her style. Okay? So I'm just going to shut up and let you watch it. And you can see a lot more here if you want to. But. So that was Eve White, you got a good sense. Keep in mind Marilyn Monroe was very popular at the, at the time of this movie. You're going to see her almost look like Marilyn Monroe. Could I speak with Eve Black now? Sure. Eve Black? I think. So I'm not going to play all of this either. But the, the important part there is 
that transformation and the, and the fact that it's the transformation of her whole style. And in her case, it seems to simply be, you know, can I speak to that other personality? And suddenly the other personality comes out. One more taste of this. Thanks to the class this morning, I remembered that. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh -oh. Uh -oh. Yeah, Primal Fear. Okay. So Primal Fear was a movie. Um, so if you do Primal Fear movie transformation, just, just as I did, I'm going to show you one part of this movie. Uh, i got to give you a little bit of a setup. So it's going to involve Edward Norton over here and Richard Gere. Uh, it's also going to have a lot of swearing, by the way, which I didn't remember until I played it in class today. So if that offends you, don't, no, I don't know, put hands over your head or something. Uh, but what I want you to pay attention to here is that, oh, sorry, let me, the lead up I want to give you is the following. Edward Norton over here has been accused of a horrific crime. Um, he is, again, almost like Eve White when we first see him in this clip. He's got that sort of demure, weak, whatever look. Um, and Richard Gere is supposed to be his lawyer defending him, but he's starting to question whether Edward Norton is innocent or not. So he's going to challenge him a little bit, and once again we're going to see a transformation, this time done by actors. So, here we go. Let's check it out. Um, as soon as I can skip the ad. I'm losing this case. You know why I'm losing this case? Because my fucking client is fucking lying to me. I never, 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 never. No more bullshit. No more bullshit. No more games. Everybody thinks you did this. Everybody. I'm the only one who believes you, and I am that close. So I want it all out. All of it. Right now. Right here. Did you underline that book? Hey, 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 look at me. Did you underline that book? No, no, I didn't. I don't believe you. That is bullshit. I, told I don't fucking believe you. Told you. I saw the tape. I saw the tape. I know what he did to you. Oh, now no. I want to hear it from you. No, no, no. no. Tell me the whole thing. Don't fucking do this. I want you to tell me the truth. And do not even think about it. You fucking killed him, didn't you? You did it. You no. killed him. You're so full of shit. You did it, didn't you? Tell me the truth. Don't lie to me. You little fuck. You did it. You killed him. You son of a bitch. You fucking killed him. No. What the hell you want from me now? Quit your crying, I can't understand a goddamn word you're saying. You little sissy, you make me sick. Oh, looky here, who the fuck are you? Who the fuck are you? Hey, it's in my cell, Jack! Who the fuck are you? I got you now. You're a lawyer. You was a lawyer, ain't you? You fancy shit, I heard about you. Well, my, my. You sure fucked this one up, counselor. It sounds to me like they're gonna shoot old Aaron so full of poison it's gonna come out his eyes. All right, so, um, you get the idea there. Again, another transformation. However, and I hate to ruin the movie for you, <laughs> and I already did a little bit, um, but what you find in the movie is that Edward Norton is not really got multiple personalities. He's just read a lot from his intro psych textbook, and he's playing this as a means of getting off a crime. Um, and of course, Edward Norton himself is an actor, and so you're seeing him do this transformation, and, and you know when you're watching the movie, okay, he's not really multiple personality. He's playing a character that has this, but he does it that way. Okay, so here's the, the point of all this um, that's critical to what we're talking about. Slide back here. When some therapists look at this sort of behavior, multiple personality disorder, and in fact any of these in this list, they are worried that what therapists are seeing is a person also acting. That for whatever reason they've created this story of multiple personalities and they keep telling that story and they keep behaving as though they have multiple personalities maybe because it helped them deal with something or whatever, but it's not that they really have multiple personalities, it's that they act like they do. Some people believe they're acting. Some people believe it's a true psychological phenomenon. Um, sometimes it's sort of split by 
um, the lines of whether you're a psychodynamic therapist or not. If you believe in Freud's ideas, then this all fits with it, and you tend to believe the phenomenon's right. If you don't, then you tend not to believe it's right. The one thing I want to add to this is that, kind of relating back to some of the other themes that I want to highlight, we all have multiple personalities. You know, it really isn't all that impressive that somebody might have multiple personalities. I, I, I've said to you before that, you know, there's the you who hangs out with your friends of the same gender as you. There's the you that hangs out with your romantic interests. There's the you that hangs out with the parents of your romantic interests. And each one of those yous is a little different. You learn to behave a little differently. You show a different side of yourself. And we could say those are, in fact, distinct personalities. But of course, for you or I, we don't think of them that way. We think of them as just different ways of showing who we are, different facets of us. But we think of all of those as us, right? Um, where here, there's this notion that, no, that's somebody else. You even saw in Edward Norton, um, in Edward Norton's clip, how he's saying, he's talking about the other personality as though it was another person. Oh, you're his lawyer, and this is what you're going to do to him. You know, not to me, to him. Uh, and so that, that's what makes the multiple personality stuff seem so freaky. Um, but is it even real? We don't know. I'm going to leave it there. Uh, let you think about it, check out some of that stuff. And we are going to march on. In fact, we're going to march on a little bit into this next one. I want to go just as far as I did in class today so that everything makes sense. Um, and so we're going to take another dramatic turn. But is it a dramatic turn? So I want to, I want to just say this, first of all, that when you're in these sort of intro psych chapters, things like these disorders are carved up as though they're you know, clean and separate things. But um, they're not really. Uh, there's a lot of overlap between a lot of these disorders. So I'm going to play along with the book at first, but I'm also going to highlight you know, some of these reasons why you shouldn't think of them as so separate. But if we go along with the book, the idea is we have the anxiety disorders that are primarily about somebody being worried about something. Um, and then there's disorders of emotion. So let's just jump into one of the disorders of emotion. I'll tie, I'll do some tying in as we go. The one we're going to start with is probably the most, um, the most dangerous mental disorder that exists, major depressive disorder. Um, by dangerous, I mean usually a person is dangerous to themselves. Um, let's just let, let let me begin by hitting this this theme that we've hit before a lot of the symptoms of mental illness are in fact symptoms we all share just not to the same extent so when we're talking about depression you know we all have days when we wake up and wonder what what's it all for why am i bothering you know with my schoolwork why am i bothering with whatever why does any of it matter you know so we can all feel like that but someone who suffers from major depressive disorder feels that more strongly, but more importantly, more chronically. So you and I tend to get over it. We tend to get on with life, we get doing stuff, and we don't tend to live in that state for a prolonged period of time. But people with major depressive disorder do. This is one um, description uh, that was written that I, that I just want to read a little bit of, of so that you get the sense of the disorder as it, as it plays out. This is exactly how most depressed people would speak, major depressed people. Do you have any idea what it's like to not want to get out of bed every morning? Not wanting to go and deal with all the bullshit outside the bed? Do you even know what it feels like to feel completely alone while you know there are millions of miserable people just like you? How about what it's like to be completely repulsed by the things you used to love? to feel completely lost in the dark and not really knowing if there's a way out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can read the rest. What will come through in, a dis in any depressive person are these sorts of um, characteristics. You know, obviously they're sad. Sad and apathetic. Apathetic means don't care, okay? 
and they don't care usually because they don't see a reason to care they get a real sense of as, as we have here worthlessness and helplessness a sense that what I do doesn't matter I can't change anything my life sucks it will always suck why should I care about anything why should I do anything nothing I do about or care about will change anything it doesn't matter okay that's sort of what we sometimes call learned helplessness um, which by the way if any of you feel like that it's completely inaccurate you have a lot more power to change your state than you realize but that's how a depressed person feels so because of that they know that other people don't enjoy being around them because they don't enjoy being around them to be quite honest so they tend to withdraw uh, become socially separated um, they often have sleep issues um, primarily because they just kind of lay around all day and that really messes with sleep cycles they don't want to do anything they don't want to eat they don't want to have sex they don't want to do much of anything except just lay around and be or in some cases they don't even want to do that anymore that's when it goes into the you know potential for suicide and, and things like that um, they may show either lethargy or agitation lethargy meaning just blah sitting around that's the prototypical one but some depressed people have everything we just talked about but they look nervous they look agitated all the time it's like their their feelings of, of worthlessness energize them but they don't energize them to do anything because nothing they do will matter they just give them this sort of anxiety anxiousness uh, this is one of the reasons by the way why I say oh we had those anxiety disorders now we're into emotion disorders well a lot of people with anxiety disorders also have issues with depression a lot of the medications we use for one we use for the other these two things are more tightly related than than a textbook may suggest okay um, so obviously you know if this is you this is a very dangerous state if it's somebody you know it's a very dangerous state um, the worry is somebody will so self convince themselves of the irrelevance and the disempowerment of their life that they will choose to end their life uh, and that's the worry when it comes to depression okay we started this slide in class um, with a left pain and we didn't get to the right pain so so we're gonna leave the right one uh, that's where I'll start next class but let me just talk you through the left one our other worry about depression is that it's common quite common um, what we have over here is the percentage of youth that are depressed um, and as a function of females or males and what we see is that um, generally speaking young females so so the worry is you know these are relatively young people we're talking about and when they say youth here um, they're literally talking anywhere from 12 to 20 years old typically and what we see already at that point is that 12 percent of girls are suffering from major depression um, four percent of males now one of the issues raised in class is maybe it's actually a higher percent of males but they don't like to admit it you know maybe this macho thing um, results in what we call under reporting so we don't know for sure these numbers are accurate accurate but you know that's what we're seeing in fact if you break this down by years of age you see well at 12 years old I mean it's there's still four percent which is still a relatively high number um, compared to some of the other incidence rates we talk about but it really seems to kick in post puberty um, 16 17 years old when all these social dynamics that that kids live in become so strong and you feel all these pressures to look a certain way or act a certain way or or people judging you if you don't look a certain way or don't act a certain way and this is where we get you know 10 percent or more of people can become so despondent can feel so disconnected uh, and so disempowered by the situation that they fall into uh, a major depressive disorder so you know it's common and it's affecting our young people and it can lead them to do things like commit suicide uh, and because of that it's an extremely serious mental illness um, with a lot of a lot of effort being put into understanding it okay so I'm gonna leave it there we'll kick over the next class here and um, yeah and, and go on from there so I hope you all have a good weekend um, and I will see you guys Monday morning all right okay bye bye